today's topic is, um, I'm going to call it philosophy. It's, it's uh, asking these big questions. We're going to talk about philosophy. We're going to talk about ethics. We're going to talk about what are, how do you start wrestling with some of these big questions that don't, like I said, don't necessarily have a singular answer that have a spectrum of answers and then how, not necessarily what is the answer, but what is the process by which you go through trying to um, create the decision that you're going to make and move forward on. Um, we are joined with Robert Laporte from Rhodes College, uh, Evelyn Brister from Rochester Institute of Technology, and Katie Barnhill Dilling, who is with NC State University. Um, each of these three uh, panelists are going to be given about a 15 to 20 minute um, overview of different types of topics, and then we'll open it up for questions. Um, if there's a question that is um, particularly uh, uh, interesting. Um, I, I will um, interrupt. I usually don't. Um, uh, we may ask questions between panelists, but more than likely I'm going to hold everything until everybody kind of gets done with, with their realm. Um, so thank you guys for giving your time and um, helping us wrestle with this. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Lisa, who will get things started off for us today. Thanks, Sarah. Um, Happy uh, Friday, everybody. So good to see such a good turnout. Um, thank you again to our panelists for joining us, Katie, Robert, and Evelyn. I can't wait. I've heard both Katie and Evelyn speak and I'm anxious to hear your, your thoughts on the subject. And I just was thinking back, we're doing a documentary film. I don't know if you knew that. It's been several years in the making, but we're still working on it. And um, our original filmmaker went to go visit our founding president uh, Phil Rudder. And I see there's a Phil on here. So forgive me if I imitate you. Um, I'm, I'm known in my family as a mimic. So this is not no, no need of disrespect. <laughs> but Phil, you said, um, chestnut makes people passionate. And that is a mystery to me. So we're going to talk about why chestnut makes so many people passionate on many ends of the spectrum. And I'm just really excited to hear what these panelists and our esteemed group has to say and the questions from the audience. So thanks for being here. And um, Sarah, I'll let you take it away to start things up. Yeah, we're gonna, we're gonna start with uh, Rob, who's gonna talk about species. What makes a species? How do you define a natural range? Um, we've done that. <laughs> That's not necessarily exactly what it is or should be, but we've made our decision of how we wanna do that. So let's introduce that topic and take it away, Rob. Great, thank you so much for the invitation to be here today. So I'm gonna to try to get my screen going here again. Uh, okay. All right, so yeah. So thank you everyone for attending today. I think this is, this is a really great set of topics. I'm really excited to hear what the rest of our panelists, uh, uh, Evelyn and Katie have to say today too, but I'm gonna to try to kick things off on this topic of sort of these big questions about philosophy and um, thinking about how we conceive of different units of biodiversity or different species, and as that applies to chestnut in particular, because that's what we're talking about today. So in my lab at Rhodes College, um, we're really interested in biodiversity. Um, we're interested in the, bio the origins of biodiversity, um, the interactions among, among different units of biodiversity, um, but also, um, you know, what do we conceive of as biodiversity? How do we circumscribe that? And what has always interested me about this question of, uh, or, the, or the chestnut story really, is that it represents the loss of biodiversity from our eastern forests. And it's, it's sort of a sad story, right? I think everybody's familiar with this. I mean, everyone, everyone that's here is passionate about this. I think that was a really great way to sort of uh, uh, frame our talk today because the American chestnut has been this species that represents like a, a, an icon of eastern North American forests. I mean, this was a dominant species throughout Eastern North America. In some places, it was like the most common species. It could, it could form these groves that were just you know, monotypic um, in, in some places and parts of the, the Southern Appalachians could be um, or could harbor some of these really ginormous trees, right? These enormous trees that were canopy trees that, that locked up a huge amount of carbon. They produced these seeds and nuts that were, that were food for wildlife, uh, but also for humans that were living in those areas. Um, they were exploited for timber. Um, they, were, they were you know just a, a really profoundly important species in some of these Eastern forests. And that was up until, I mean, through historic times, through, through pre-glacial times, and then all the way up through about the mid 1900s. And everyone knows the story that, you know, by then um, the, the chestnut blight had really started just um, decimating uh, 
uh, chestnuts throughout the eastern uh, the eastern forests of the United States and, and Canada as well. And so after its introduction to or its inadvertent introduction into the New York area in the early 1900s, about 1901 or so, this 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 fungal blight spread mercilessly throughout the range southwestward. And by about 1950, it had reached every part of the American chestnut range and, and wiped those trees out. This is frustrating in a lot of ways. I think you know a lot of dimensions that you guys have had talks about already or had some of these panels that have discussed some of these issues. But for me, it's, it's really frustrating because Eastern North American forests have been recovering over the last 50, 70 years or so. Um, you know, these recoveries, we've, we've seen uh, massive changes to uh, the amount of uh, woody biomass or forest biomass in these Eastern forests shown here with the, the intensity of the green in this map on the left that those darker green areas are forests that are coming back after um, changes to land use history. So increased urbanization in the post-war period, changes to uh, forest harvesting and timber harvesting throughout these areas. And so we see these forests coming back and, and, and much to many of our benefits where there's more opportunities for getting out. It restores some of these, uh, for getting out for recreation, it restores some of these areas for some of their natural ecological purposes and in ecological cycling. But of course, chestnut is being lost. I mean, these are the areas where chestnut tended to occur, um, but we just are not having chestnut coming back with the recovery of these forests because of chestnut blight. And so that means that the ecosystem role of American chestnut is, is different, right? I mean, it's no longer that we see these huge trees. We no longer see these large annual inputs of, of, of nutritious uh, seeds for wildlife and for, for human consumption. We no longer have these trees locking up huge amounts of carbon for decades or centuries even. Instead, we have these small trees that we tend to see throughout most, most of the range. I mean, there are, there are some exceptions to this where there are larger trees, but most of them are these shrubby little things that occur in the understory. And so we have this rare, you know, minor species occurring throughout the former range of the American chestnut. And so we don't really know what the role of this, this new thing is, this new entity. So one of the proposed methods over the last 50 years or 40 years at least uh, to try to recover this species and bring it back to its former ecological role or ecosystem interactions is through hybridization. So we've you know, for a long time been taking this approach of trying to hybridize American chestnut with primarily Chinese chestnut, chestnut to breed in uh, or to bring in some of those traits associated with uh, blight resistance. And then we've taken the approach of back crossing that to American chestnut to try to increase the, the genetic component of American chestnut in those trees. So instead of going from having a half Chinese chestnut, half American chestnut in that F1 generation or the initial cross, doing these back, successive back crosses to try to have a true breeding, mostly American chestnut tree that can be reintroduced to the forests of Eastern North America. And you know, I, yes, that's a, that's a great approach. I mean, it takes a long time because we're dealing with trees, of course, but there are some questions associated with this. I and mean, I think from a biological perspective, and, and I think also from a philosophical perspective, what is this entity that we end up with? What is this entity that we're dealing with? Is this actually the same species? Is it the same species as, as, as used to be here? I mean, we've brought in some of the genetic material of Chinese chestnut. Um, do we consider it to be a native species anymore? Or is this actually something different, right? It, it, it has some of the genetic material that originally originated in China or parts of East Asia, and those genes or the genetic material was locally adapted to those ecosystems. And so there's still some questions about what does it do in the ecosystem? Does it have all the same ecosystem interactions with other species that exist here in Eastern North America, or are they slightly different? And if they are different, or if this is not really the same species, what do we think about that? So I first just wanted to get a sense here from people um, that are listening in. If you could actually put it in the chat, I'm just curious, you know, looking at these two pictures, do you think that these two entities are different species or not different species, or do you not know? I mean, I think there could be opportunities here for, for needing other information or being a little bit ambiguous about it. So if you were to approach something like this, you see this tree and you see this tree, and then you get closer and you look at the leaves of those trees, you can see that there are some difference, differences between them, right? There's some differences in shape, um, perhaps the thickness of the leaves or the venation, for example. And so you're starting to look at those and notice some of these differences. So I just wanna ask, like, what do people think? Different species, not different species? 
or you do, do you not know? And if you don't know, what kind of other information would you need to answer that question? So one of the things that we think about as biologists is, you know, this first approximation of, well, these things look different. So maybe they are different species, but there's a lot of other information which I'm about to talk about that could go into our decision about whether these are different species or not. And I think that one, some of the questions that arise from this are how do we actually recognize and name different species? Like what information do we need? What are the things that are most important to us when we make a decision like this? Um, also, how, how does this way that we, or how does the way that we actually define these species or how do the, how do the ways that we um, understand differences in biodiversity influence our understanding of what that biodiversity is? How do we understand the origins of that biodiversity? How do we understand how different species interact or different units of biodiversity interact with each other in, in natural environments. And then of course, how does our understanding of that biodiversity then once we've defined it, influence our thoughts about conservation or restoration or what's important in our ecosystems? Because these are really you know, fundamental questions that I think about quite a bit. I think about these with my students, we talk about these kinds of questions and there aren't really clear answers to some of these sometimes. We, we, these, are, these are extant debates in the scientific world. But what I do like to think about is that, you know, biologists in general, so I, I work within the realm of the, the Western tradition of biology, the Western tradition of, of science, and biologists at writ, uh, circumscribed as such have always wondered what species are and where they come from. So if we even go back to, you know, Charles Darwin writing in the book On the Origin of Species, you know, this could be on the origin of biodiversity from my perspective, but he wrote that went on board the HMS Beagle as a naturalist, he was much struck with certain facts in the distribution of the inhabitants of South America and in the geological relations of the present to the past inhabitants of that continent. These facts seem to me to throw some light on the origin of species, that mystery of mysteries, as it has been called by one of our great philosophers. So there's a couple of really important parts of this, I think, that, that Darwin was able to elocute quite well here. So he was able to express this mystery of mysteries because it's kind of hidden. What are species? How do they arise? How do we get new species from other species? And then he explicitly makes this tie between the present and the past. And I think that's really important. And I'm going to try to riff on that a little bit as I talk about some of these issues. But certainly Darwin was not the first one to observe this. I mean, certainly indigenous populations around the world were observing that there were differences between different units of biodiversity. They may not have conceived of it in quite the same terminology, but they had different ways of looking at the world and identifying what things were different from each other and which things were the same. The problem from a biological perspective is what are species? And so we often think of these as pretty well-defined units. They're a fundamental unit of biological classification. I mean, people that take biology understand that we get down from kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus to species. And so we have to have you know, these units that we identify as species that we recognize, that we share a recognition over. And we often typically think of them as these evolutionarily independent populations. They're, they're populations of organisms that interact with each other and they're evolutionarily independent from other such units of biodiversity or other such populations. Unfortunately, there is no single universally accepted or applicable definition of species. And that's a problem, right? I mean, I like to think of it in terms of this, this cartoon, for example, right? If, if you were to come to earth and try to, being naive to the, the units of biodiversity who are the biological organisms living on this planet, how would you separate those as being different species? And so, you know, you could conceive of them to these two extraterrestrials as being all the same. They look alike to me, right? So what, you know, these are all mammals being shown except for this guy down here. So maybe it's different. What I'd like to talk about and introduce to, to sort of talk about this problem a little bit more is that there are three common concepts of species that we, we use quite a bit. Um, some of these you, you may be familiar with or at least colloquially familiar with. Some of them may be a little bit more arcane. But these three common concepts are the morpho species or, or the morphological species concept the phylogenetic species concept and the biological species concept. So this morpho species or the morphological species concept really is like its name describes. It's really talking about what do organisms look like? Do they look the same or do they look different? And here species are really defined as being unique combination or having unique combinations of traits or 
comprising these unique combinations of physiological traits that may not be seen very easily, but you could measure in some way. The problems with this species or this concept um, is that species can differ in non-morphological ways, making it very difficult to identify them. And so here in our example that I gave you, we have these pretty clear morphological differences in these leaf shapes. Um, so between this, this Quercus alba and this Quercus rubra, right? So the, the white oak and, and our northern red oak here, those are pretty distinct species um, when you look at them for the most part, they, they have these different leaf shapes, but there could be some differences in some of the underlying physiology that make this kind of hard to, to, to differentiate them. And that highlights that the choice of characteristics that we use to actually differentiate these things is subjective. It depends upon the viewer or the expert that's looking at them. Now, this might be pretty easy. We have some different lobe shapes to these leaves. The margins of those leaves look quite different. But if you're looking at something really small, it might come down to who the expert is in that group that decides what is important and what's not important as a distinguishing character. The other thing that we run into quite a bit is this idea that species on different continents or different parts of the world sometimes evolve convergently, meaning they evolve to look very similar or evolve similar traits. You can think of some of the North American mammals and then Australian marsupials evolving to look similar to fill, some, to fill similar ecological niches. And that can lead to some confusion about whether they're species. I mean, clearly those are species, they're marsupials versus eutherian mammals or placental mammals but it can cause some problems. Another way to think about that is with new world cactuses and old world euphorbia, if you're familiar with those groups. Our next species concept is this phylogenetic species concept. So here we're thinking about um, the evolutionary relationships. This is explicitly about those relationships between lineages of organisms. And we do this building, uh, we, we, we assess this building what's called the phylogenetic tree or an evolutionary tree. And today we, we mostly do that using DNA molecular data or sequence data. Um, so we can get sequence information from organisms that we're interested in and build a, a phylogeny or an evolutionary tree, which is a diagram shown here on the, on the right, a diagram of the evolutionary relationships between organisms, but also their evolutionary history. And so one example of that is with these Hawaiian crickets. Um, many of these species look pretty similar, but they're distributed across the Hawaiian islands in that archipelago. And there are many species here, um, but these, these clades, we call them or these groups that are colored in, in a similar color represent uh, individuals or lineages that come from the islands here in this diagram. And within that we have these different species named. And mostly here we have these nice unique uh, groups of organisms that represent one species. They come from a common ancestor. So these are all lineages, for example, descendant from a common ancestor. But sometimes it's a little bit more complex. So for example, in this top group here, this, this pink one, we have this one species, it's all one group, but next to it, we've got this or a series of blue ones. They all come from the same island and they represent different species, but they're not actually all that closely related to each other either. So it's, it's unclear like where some of those origins from a common ancestor actually come from. Oop, I'm sorry, I jumped ahead there. Um, so some of the problems here that any, any population or any level of diversity, so we could go to things like genera or families, so levels above the species that could represent a unit of, of diversity. And so it's hard to know where to draw that line. The other problem here is that evolutionary trees or phylogenetic trees are not available for all of life. We don't have sequence, DNA sequence data for all life. So it's hard to use this, this or apply this method or this concept to all units of biodiversity. Although this is becoming less of a problem as we, as we gain more sequence information. Also, this could potentially lead to many more species being recognized than currently than are currently recognized, which could be a problem for cataloging that biodiversity and understanding how that biodiversity actually interacts with each other. Our last, uh, the last major concept that I want to talk about is this biological species concept. And this really has to do with um, whether organisms can breed with each other and produce viable fertile offspring and that they are separated or they are prevented from creating um, viable fertile offspring with other uh, organisms that we would call species, so other populations or other species. This is a species concept that you're probably pretty familiar with. I mean, one of the classic examples of this um, to, to prove or to demonstrate this principle is if you take a male donkey and cross that with a female horse, you produce a mule. That mule, however, is sterile. And so that fails to meet the criteria of this biological species concept. It 
that results in viable offspring, but they are not fertile. And so these mules cannot propagate themselves and they cannot uh, interbreed then with either the horses or the donkeys. And so we would say then that horses and donkeys represent unique and dis you know, distinct species by the biological species concept. One of the, or the set of problems with this particular concept is it actually applies relatively poorly to plants, as well as other organisms like bacterial clonal organisms that, that propagate themselves clonally, um, and as well as extinct organisms. For example, you're not going to be using the biological species concept to determine whether uh, fossils of dinosaurs are different species. The problem with it, it, it applying poorly to plants is that plants can be quite divergent. They can be divergent and independently evolving for many millions of years, but can still hybridize and produce viable and fertile offspring. And so there's a big debate about whether the biological species concept even applies in plants. And this also raises some questions about organisms that don't naturally geographically overlap. If you were to take a species from another continent and bring it here and hybridize it with a species that exists here in North America, does that mean that they aren't species if they do produce those viable fertile offspring? Or are they species? Because they actually occur in very different areas and they've adapted to these, these very different places on earth. And so in practice, in, in biology, we tend to take a more general approach. We've, we've taken this um, approach to, that is along the lines of this general lineage concept, a, a, another sort of uh, concept of species that I didn't introduce to begin with. But, Basically, what that says is that we all pretty we all know pretty well. We all kind of agree that when you know we know what one species looks like, and we also know what two different species look like. But there's kind of this gray zone, and it's that gray zone where there's a lot of debate about how do we actually understand units of biodiversity. We might apply multiple different species concepts to understand when we have different species. So in general, this concept just says that species are independently evolving lineages. They're groups of individuals that exchange genes frequently enough to comprise the same gene pool, and they're separated from these other gene pools. So we might see a little bit of interbreeding here, but it kind of fades out over time. So we're, we're looking at that time axis. And that's what's really important about this, this question is that we're trying to put discrete categories on something that is a continuous process. So what I, I wanna go back to this idea about thinking of those, those species concepts and how we understand the ways that we're trying to approach uh, restoration of American chest nuts. So for example, um, that hybridization between American and, and Chinese chestnut, chestnut could be failing to meet our, our concept of them being distinct species. And so maybe this hybrid is not the same species that we had before. As this applies to this GMO approach to, or this gene technology approach to restoring the American chestnut, if we're, if we're taking American chestnut, 100% American chestnut from North America and bringing in just a gene or a little bit of genetic material from another organism, that maybe is better in some ways for thinking about whether it's the same species that used to be here before the blight, before the blight wiped it out. And so we basically have 100% pure Castania dentata, except for like that one gene that we're bringing in from, from uh, wheat. Um, but that traditional breeding approach, you know, even if we're really good at it and get something like 99% of the American chestnut genome in there, we still have something like 1% of, of Chinese chestnut in there. And we don't know what's in that 1%, right? I mean, so the human and the chimpanzee genomes differ by like 1% or up to 4%. So that 1% of difference, you know, between American and Chinese chestnut or what's in that hybrid could actually constitute quite a bit. It could indicate that there's quite a bit of differentiation in there in the genome. The other thing that I wanna sort of wrap up with is talking about that restoration requiring genetic variation that exists within the native range. And we all kind of have seen a map like this of, of the native range of American chestnut. And here what I'm showing from the American Chestnut Foundation is that there's a lot of genetic diversity down here in the southern portion of the range, particularly where, place, where it has been surveyed in the southern Appalachians. And there's less genetic diversity in these blue dots, these populations that are marked in blue um, in more northern parts of the range. But we know that having some of that genetic diversity in there uh, from these southern portions of the range is really critical for restoration. We need that native genetic diversity brought into these entities that we're going to plant back out because those, that genetic diversity is really important for resistance to Natural, uh, native uh, uh, pathogens that might exist. It also constitutes potentially genes that, that help the, the 
the species adapts to local environments or represents local adaptation to uh, climates that occur in the southern part of the range versus in the northern part of the range. So there's differences in winters and summers and the heat and, and, and rainfall uh, regimes in different places. And we need to survey more of these areas and bring in some of that native biodiversity to better understand what this species actually looked like over time. So making that connection to the past uh, for this, this native species that we have today. And so why is there more genetic diversity in, in this, these southern areas? Well, it has to do at least most proximally with, with the last glaciation. So we think about this Laurentide ice sheet extending all the way down into parts, you know, through the Great Lakes and in, even into parts of the middle um, Mississippi River Valley. And it's not that American chestnut could have really existed right at the edge of that, um, representing part of its the today's native range because that probably represented more like tundra habitat and that we know that from um, looking at pollen records from lakes that were never glaciated further south here so looking at uh, white pond in south carolina a pretty well studied lake where we have um, sediments that have been dredged up and we can look at pollen that's been captured in the sediments down there and we know that you know about nine thousand years ago there weren't typical hardwood forest species around there. It looked more like parts of middle central Canada and Alaska today with a lot of spruces, this picea pollen shows up in there, but also um, Eastern white pine. So Pinostrobus is in there about 9,000 years ago. And we don't really see species that we recognize occurring in Eastern North America, these hardwood species until after about 8,500 years ago. And so we start seeing uh, the contributions from Quercus, so the oaks and elms uh, but also from beaches and maples um, showing up around, you know, after 8,000 years ago, but certainly by about six or 7,000 years ago, they've become much more common in those records. And this is interesting from, from my perspective here in, in the Mid-South, where, you know, this is kind of far away, but it represents a similar climatic zone to today. And so what we know is that American chestnut was not, it did not extend all the way up into Maine and into Southern Canada um, during these glacial periods. This is those, that range is, or that distribution is really recent. We know that American chestnut was likely pushed into these really far southern refugia down in um, the coastal plain of North and South Carolina and also to south, uh, southern Mississippi and Alabama and probably out even onto the continental shelf because those continental shelves were exposed with sea level changes during that glacial period. And only really recently after that post-glacial uh, retreat um, have these, these organisms actually expanded? Has chestnut expanded through what we accept today is its native range? And yet we know that, you know, historical records well after the glaciers, these historical records show that chestnut was around. It was important in all these areas. And for my, for my area here in, in far southwestern, the far, far southwestern part of the range, we know that it was really important. And so we're doing some surveys here to try to identify areas where we can find some of these plants and incorporate them into some of these studies to better understand what that genetic diversity looks like over time. All right, I think that's it for today. Oh yeah, nice, good. Well, you covered a lot and, and actually there's a lot more there too. So I um, maybe we'll have to revisit this too. I mean, one thing that we didn't get into and not that I expected you to is how did American chestnuts diverge from Chinese chestnuts, diverging from European, diverging from Japanese, and how does that fit into the whole scheme of things? I mean, there this is a huge, huge issue. So, yeah. um, thank you for you know touching <laughs> the surface of that. Um, before we move on to Evelyn, I want to throw out a couple of questions um, that folks had. Yeah. Or uh, do oaks cross? Do the oaks that you showed, the white oak and the the red oak, do they cross with with each other naturally? And so you touched on that 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 is typically the traditional th thought of of speciation. But in yeah. your particular example, do they cross? That's a good question. I don't know if they cross a lot uh, naturally. For those two, they come from different sections of the oak clade, the oak group. Um, but there is a lot of hybridization between oaks. So within the white oaks and within the red oaks, they do hybridize quite a bit. And that has been a question over time is like, are there even really species in the oaks? I mean, the short answer is yes, but there is some natural hybridization between those oak species, but they do tend to sort out depending on where they live. It's just in some of those areas where they co-occur that they hybridize a little bit. I'm gonna ask two more. Yeah. Uh, Susan asks, chestnuts, existed interactively with other species? Have any of those species disappeared or been altered in some way that you know of? Yeah, that's a really great question. I, I don't know. I'm starting to get into that a little bit more. There, 
I mean, that's a really great question that I've, I've been interested in for, for a while, because I think that losing those, you know, those ecological interactions associated with chestnut is probably one of the major things that we should be focusing on from an ecological perspective in Eastern North America. I mean, if this was a common species, it had interactions with a lot of invertebrates, um, with other plant species in those areas. I don't know of any that have gone extinct or been lost from Eastern forest with or concurrently with American chestnut. Uh, but I would not be surprised if there were some microorganisms that formed associations with the roots of the plants, for example, have been functionally extirpated along with it. Um, but there are other plant species, other tree species in Eastern North America that are facing extirpation from introduced pathogens. And that's a problem, right? Because this is, it's, a not, a, it's not a unique problem to American chestnut. We have been facilitating this or we are the root cause of loss of other species as well. All right, I lied, two more. Um, Mike Alcott says, wouldn't a better sense of ecosystem services provided by a species and a more quantitative assessment of the ecosystem role of an organism help clarify the difference if, if those differences are significant? Yeah, I think I understand where you're going with it. I think I've been thinking about some of those for a while and grappling with this, this uh, definition of like biodiversity and how we think of units of biodiversity interacting with each other. And I think that, you know, one of the principal ways that I, one of my principal lines of, of investigation is to understand um, some of that genetic di diversity that arises in different plant species. And for example, some, many plants actually exhibit this variation called polyploidy, so they duplicate their genomes. And historically, we think of them as being the same species, even though they have different numbers of gene or different numbers of chromosomes, and they can't hybridize very well. And nobody's really been looking um, categorically or quantitatively to really understand whether they interact with other species and with each other in different ways. And I think that's really important because we may have many more species, at least from a functional perspective than from a taxonomic or a categorization perspective than we actually appreciate. And I think that's really important to get at those, those functional questions. Right, right in that niche that, they, that they're in. All right, yeah. last one. This is more of a, uh, an applied question. Can you give a quick response to the question of how chestnuts originated and diverged? Are they older than separation of the supercontinent? Cool. Uh, that's not something I'm well versed in, but the, God, that's, yeah, that's a couple hundred million years probably from, from Eastern China. So I think a lot, a lot of the species in Eastern North America have close relatives in parts of Eastern China or East Asia. And I forget when that divergence really happened, but that's- I, I can, I, can, I, I just, yeah. just reread that paper yesterday. Yeah, so, okay, I can, yeah. <laughs> so there's a, um, there's a great paper that was published in 07, 09, somewhere in that time frame. Finney Dane um, worked with some colleagues. And so they, their research shows a westward migration and they hypothesize it would have happened about 30 to 40 million years ago. Okay. Um, yeah. So Japanese chestnuts branched off first and went and did their yeah. own thing. Um, Chinese chestnuts are the, the, the origination. So in China or Southeastern China, Japanese split off, European split off, and then American chestnut split off from that. And it was like, you know, and then the chinkapins, the, the chinkapin came first, then the American chestnut, and then got Ozark chinkapin from that, so, mm -hmm. something like that. Yeah. Um, it's a great, it's a, it's a great paper, but the, um, yeah. that was Dane. Yeah. I think that I was Finney Dane. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And the, the thinking is they, they could have come from across the Bering land bridge, mm -hmm. but it's more likely that it came across the North Atlantic land bridge, um, 20 to 30 million years ago is the current thinking. Yeah, so that makes sense, this? I guess if, it, if it's the North Atlantic route, that could be, yeah, that makes sense. So, I mean, they're, they're quite divergent. Um, that's, and the fact that they can hybridize is pretty surprising. And I think it, again, highlights this, you know, gra you know, highlights the grappling with the biological species concept that we need to do. I mean, we can hybridize most or all of those Castania species, but they're all pretty divergent from each other. Yes. Um, Thank you, Rob. I'm sure we'll, we'll bring you back in as we address other questions. I'm going to move it on to Evelyn and um, have her uh, give a, a, an overview of ethics. Thanks, Sarah, and thanks for inviting me. And I really enjoyed Rob's talk. I, um, I love the philosophy of biology and uh, thinking about the um, species concept. OK, uh, share screen and Here's my talk. Okay, um, I'm a philosopher and I'm primarily a philosopher of science. 
Uh, but now that I'm working on environmental restoration, I'm doing some more ethics. Um, and I have a background too in um, environmental science and specifically forest ecology. So I think sometimes when um, ethical questions come up, I have some similar gut reactions that scientists do that make me think, wow, this is a pretty soft question and there are lots of ways of approaching it and it's really important, but do I, do I have the uh, categorizations I need to answer it? Um, and so let's, let's move through this and I'll try to provide some categorizations for approaching those kinds of questions that we get about values and how values um, motivate us to think about restoration. So a lot of the, um, the ideas and the concerns that I'll talk about today, I drew out of the Federal Register um, comments, uh, the comments on the, uh, 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 on the petition. So I can provide the link for that uh, after the talk. Okay. Um, I don't know how to advance these slides. Let's see. Should just be a right arrow. Is it should not... be, but it is not. Uh oh. Okay, so. Would you escape and then try it? Yeah, try I'm going to try that again. Um, um, while you're doing that, Evelyn, um, it, it worked before, so I, we yeah, could, yeah, I, yeah, I, we I, did. I'm sure we could do it again. Um, so both Scott and Mike asked for the citation of the paper. So I'm, I'm working on that. I'm going to post that in the chat and in, in the Q&A. Um, if you guys asked a question, um, hop into the Q&A. There's three different tabs at the top. There's open questions, which are questions we haven't gotten to yet. There's answered questions. That's if I either say we're going to answer it live or Kendra and I have been um, answering some questions um, by typing them out. There we go, Evelyn. Excellent. Yeah, I did the exactly the same thing that I did a minute ago. So okay. um, tech. So the question is why restore the American chestnut? I think a lot of the talks in this series are about the how, and we're most, many of us, all of us, I don't know, we're enthusiastic about restoration. Um, and so we, we're convinced that it's worth restoring, but not everyone is. And we're often talking to people and it's worthwhile to go back and think about why are we so passionate about restoring the chestnut and where does that come from? Um, I don't need to cover for this argument, this our audience, the nature of the threat. Um, and, but I, I want to show you this slide because I'll be coming back to it in just a minute. But we have, you know, Phytophthora as a, as a uh, concern and then the chestnut blight and how it wiped out the, the, um, the chestnut on the East Coast and attempts to crossbreed um, and now we have the option, perhaps, of introducing the Darling 58 variety. So our options for restoration include traditional conservation techniques um, to um, conserve material from legacy trees, to use that to try to identify natural resistance, to interbreed within the population, to crossbreed, um, and then maybe the uh, Darling 58 presents an opportunity to combine those traditional conservation techniques with the biotech, a biotech version of the tree. And this is the um, presumed path forward to try to reintroduce the species throughout the um, natural range. But what are the moral concerns for this? So what are the motivations? And then what are the concerns about but why do we want to restore? What's the concern if we don't restore? And what worries do people have that come up with restoration? And there are two groups of concerns. One is restoration itself. So there are some people who are concerned that the tree, because it has, um, it's no longer reprodu reproducing in the landscape, that it doesn't occupy that ecological niche anymore, things have changed and we've missed an opportunity. Um, and then there are other people who are not concerned about restoration itself, but about specifically restoring with um, a 
uh, tree that's that's been produced, a variety that's been produced using crossbreeding or using biotech. I'll mostly focus on biotech in the next few slides. Um, but all of these concerns, I think, for all of the options um, do come up. So I'll, I want to address several questions. I think the one I'll spend least amount of time is on is what makes a forest natural? And so when we introduce a bioengineered tree or a backcross tree or a hybrid tree, does that make a forest seem less natural? And then a more interesting question is, does it make it less wild? Um, and then I wanna look at two other questions uh, that I'll frame in terms of arrogance or um, a, a lack of humility that is sometimes associated with dominating nature and different ways of framing that that can lead us to look at ecological risks or that can lead us to look, about, look at just the attitude that we have towards restoration, whether or not that's an appropriate relationship that we're forming with nature. So this is the slide I showed you before. I said I wanted to return to it. This helps us think about what's natural because all of the items that I've ha I have listed that tell us about the nature of the threat, where we are now, and the possible path forward, all of those are examples of human impacts on natural conditions. And so if we are thinking about forests as being natural in the sense that they're unaffected by human activities, we're really far past that. And it's not just because um, of agriculture and timbering and the land use impacts on forests, but also because the origin of the, um, of these, of the fungus, of the pest, um, of the, even of climate change as a, a negative impact on forest health, that all of those have been mediated by human activity. And so, Allowing a forest, allowing forest dynamics to move forward without um, any human impact, isn't, that's not really an option that's available to, to us right now. So one way that this point was described, I thought was very nice, was this quote here that I have where you, with regard to introduced species and, and pass where a scientist says what people are not seeing is that this is already a genetically modified environment. So the, the, the forests right now are not, we may not have a genetically modified tree in them, but the full scope of the changes that have taken place of the biodiversity that's lost, of the gene diversity that's lost, that those changes are already significantly modified and they're modified by humans. I like thinking about this question of, of wildness too, because it's a nice one where, whereas it's pretty clear that natural means different things in different contexts. You know, there, there are foods on, in my pantry shelves, some of which are, are labeled natural as though the other ones are unnatural. Um, so natural we recognize as being a, a very, um, unclear term, vague term. I think though, we tend to think that wild is a term that we're more clear on. And so it's nice to decompose, it's fun to decompose that concept of wildness um, because we can show at least six different meanings. I think there are more in the paper that I base this analysis on, Claire Palmer identifies seven different meanings, very distinct meanings of wildness. So, you know, one question that comes up is if, if there were a genetically modified tree in the forest, would that make the forest less wild? Would, and, and, and what do I mean if I ask that question? So here's several possibilities. Um, one possibility is that I might mean um, that a wild organism is one that is not domesticated. So organisms that are independent are those that don't rely on us for reproduction. So in the context of animals, um, our pets, are not wild, 
and in the context of plants, um, a corn plant is not wild, that it relies on um, plowing and inputs for uh, it, to, it to survive and thrive. And that's a little different maybe than the saying that something is, is tame. So something that's not wild could also, the contrast word might be, might be tame. Um, and there are things that are not domesticated, but they're still tame, right? So there are some deer in my neighborhood that are relatively tame. And those, those animals are autonomous. Um, they do their own thing. Um, yeah. But they, um, so animals that are not tame or wild animals could be not domesticated, but they could be tamed and in that sense, not wild. And then there's another sense of applying the word wild to an organism. And that is organisms that have been altered by humans are not wild. Um, so I'll come back to evaluate this in the context of the chestnut. But first let's think about how wildness can apply to organisms or it can apply to places. And that's a different, that's a different sense. Um, sometimes we talk about a creature that being wild. Other times we want to say, well, um, there are wild places and they might have tame creatures in them, but the place itself remains wild. So if I take my dog hiking in the forest, the forest is still wild. So the place is wild. Okay, so how do we think of wildness in terms of places? So first there are places that are historically unaffected by human actions, that they're wild because humans have never been there or humans have never had um, an impact on those places. That would be a very um, pure sense of wild. And there are other places where maybe humans have had an impact, but the composition of species is still the same. So they're, they're wild in that sense. There's something still original about them. Um, and then a third sense would be places that when I go there, I experience them as wild. So compared to downtown Rochester, which feels um, very much like a built environment, I can go out in the countryside and even around here and feel like I'm in a wild place. So let's think about how each of these apply to, the, to chestnut and whether a GM chestnut specifically would um, undermine or prevent us from saying that the forest was wild. So um, if we're thinking about domestication, then a forest with a GM species, yes, would still be wild. If we're thinking about um, whether that tree would be autonomous, would it be doing its own thing? Um, would it be free of continued management? Then it would probably still be wild. So we may want to monitor the spread of chestnuts, but ideally, the goal is to release them and it, in such a way that they can reproduce themselves. In the third sense, would that organism be unaltered by humans? And it's clear that that sense of wild would be lost. Um, okay, so now let's think about places. So um, the places, uh, forests, are they historically unaffected by humans? Would they be, historic, would they be unaffected by humans if we restored a chestnut? Um, no, that, you know, by, by putting a chestnut in, we would be affecting the forest. But the, the, the interesting thing to notice there is that, that that has already happened. So whether the biotech chestnut is, is introduced into forests or not, those forests have already lost wildness in that sense. Um, on the other hand, Restoring the chestnut, however it's restored, would maintain a composition of species that we could consider wild. And we might still be able to visit the forest and have that experience of wildness as something that's, um, that's not under human control. So we wind up with saying that there are, out of six senses, four of the senses of wildness would still be compatible with the introduction of a biotech tree and one of them would not, but, but regardless, not because of biotech, but just because it's already been lost. So the last set of questions I wanna raise is about 
the attitude that we take, the moral attitude that we can take towards restoration. And in thinking that we can fix nature, that's a, that's a concern that often comes up in, in restoration ethics, that when humans think that they can fix nature, even if they caused it, that there is a kind of arrogance in that. And that arrogance can be seen as, um, as a, a biased belief, as overestimating the control and the knowledge that humans have that may be related to some of the problems, environmental problems that we've caused in the first place. Um, but it can also be seen not as, not as a belief, but as a, as a kind of vice. So there could be epistemic arrogance or there can be moral arrogance. Um, so the concern about epistemic arrogance, about arrogance in terms of knowledge or a, a belief that we, we think we know too much, more than we actually do, is that there are fears of unintended consequences. Um, and those, those, are based, those fears are based in real events, events that ecologists are, try to be very careful to avoid going forward. And so that's the reason, of course, for um, extensive and careful research. And then arrogance as a vice is the concern that, are we doing restoration for the right reasons? Do we have generous intentions or do we have selfish intentions? And in pursuing restoration, is that creating a culture of care and reestablishing re relationships between humans to um, uh, right a past wrong? Or is it um, reinstating a culture of dominance over nature, thinking that um, whatever goes wrong, we can fix it in the future and we don't need to worry about it. So those are the concerns. And I think I'm running out of time. So I'm gonna go through these last two slides very quickly, um, but I just wanna frame the kinds of answers that we could give to concerns about whether we have good intentions um, we can ask about um, what's the full context of what's been tried. Um, is the, our proposed trees um, offered from the perspective of the ways that humans will benefit from them only, or also from the perspective of restoring nature, of, um, of benefiting something outside of humans? And then can we use restoration of chestnut as a way to um, improve culture, to, um, re, to grow a sense of care for others, a community of care, and to repair harms and even to prevent future harms? Um, and is it done in the spirit of um, producing something of value for future human generations? So there we go. Thanks, Evelyn. Sorry, I was I was getting a coffee delivery while I could give to my mouse quick enough. Um, so uh, thank you. That was great. I want to ask a question. Someone asked in here, and I don't know if you want to address this or not. So feel free to say no. Um, but uh, Jim C asks. Like ownership, there's a lot of different types of ownership in the Eastern US where we're gonna be looking, most of it's privately owned. I mean, great majority of it is privately owned. A private landowner can plant anything. They can plant anything they want. Chinese chestnut, Japanese chestnut, they, they could, I don't know why they would, but they could plant a forest full of ailanthus. Right, what, but they can't plant, they can't plant biotech. That, not currently, right. no. Yeah. But I think the question is, if you look at some of these questions from what are sort of the ethical issues, if any, of leaving those kinds of decisions to, you know, anyone, is there, is there some framework there to help, you know, a private landowner versus a, you know, a public landowner has to go through a lot of um, democratic <laughs> uh, decision-making right. while as a private landowner doesn't. So I don't know if you can speak to, to that differentiation at all and how, how, we, how we can wrestle with that as the foundation. Well, I, I mean, I think that, so I'm, th I'm talking about motivations more than I am about like the, the list of invasive species, right? But the motivation, so the motivation for landowners when they uh, decide whether to plant and what to plant 
you know, has a lot to do with what do they want? Not, I mean, we're talking about trees, right? So we're hoping they'll outlive us. So it has to do with thinking about, well, what do we want to leave to future generations? And how do these trees or how does whatever we plant on our land, how does it fit in the landscape? Um, and how does it fit with, with what's around us? Yeah. So I think those questions, from my perspective, they come down to thinking about, are you thinking about your own, your own benefit, which we are completely allowed to do. And without private landowners doing that, we wouldn't have agriculture, right? So we're, we're all dependent on farmers um, growing food for us. But uh, we also, as private landowners, have the ability to think about what our own goals are and how we might contribute to others and to, the, to, to nature. Um, Jason says, I really appreciate Dr. Brister's reference to Palmer's framework for thinking about wildness. How should we deal with the reality that various people might add other categories to Palmer's list or might answer the question for the GE chestnut differently than the way you do? How do philosophers help us think through these areas where perspectives differ on these important questions? Yeah, I think that, well, I think just noticing, uh, the first step is just noticing that we're using these terms in very different ways. So you can be having a conversation with someone, you think you're on the same page because you're using the same word, but you're just talking past each other because you've unpacked those concepts in different ways. I think um, what, a philo what, what philosophers can't do is say, which is the right concept of these various concepts, but we can help uh, help unpack them and sh show what the implications are and what the limitations are too. So in, I think in this way, um, ethics and knowledge are very much tied. So philosophers and scientists work together um, because if we are thinking that there's some action that we can take to remove past historical Im impact of humans on the land, we have to realize, well, that option is not available to us. That those changes, even with ongoing climate change, those are taking place. Um, there's so many good comments in the chat okay. and more questions, but I want to make sure we get to Katie. I want to hear so, Katie's talk. Yeah, yeah. Let's, let's go to Katie. I'm going to save some of these for the end and we'll, we'll go as long as we can. So thank you so much, Evelyn. And, and Evelyn, if you get a chance, if you want to type anything out too while we're doing that and listening to Katie, that, that'll help too. Thank you, Sarah, and thanks for the invitation today, and thanks to everyone out there joining us. Um, I'm going to turn this a slightly different direction today. Um, it's been really nice to hear about the philosophical questions that underpin both species and our relationship to nature. Um, I'm going to take it into more of a social science direction, so moving from the humanities into the social sciences and talking about these dimensions of chestnut restoration. Um, just as a starting point, uh, I'm motivated by the big hairy question of how do we make decisions about our shared planet? Um, so that's a slightly different set of questions than the previous two speakers, but I think their work really feeds into the kinds of things that I'll be talking about today. And more specifically, I think about how we make decisions about our shared environments that are rooted more firmly and meaningfully in justice, and then asking questions about justice for whom. So I spent my whole PhD studying this question through the lens of chestnut restoration that potentially uses this transgenic line. Um, so here is a case that is like an environmental social science social scientists ultimate soap opera. There's this charismatic species with this heartbreaking story, this sort of hero's quest to combat the villainous chestnut blight. All of this is overlaid by the fact that there are plenty of groups in the world who think chestnut, um, excuse me, genetic engineering and gene editing and synthetic biology are the real villains. And so this is sort of the context that I come to these questions. And then there's this backdrop again, we have intractable species loss and conservation scientists and practitioners around the globe are looking at biotechnology as possible transformational tools that may succeed where conventional conservation practices have failed. But again, we have this tension. It's, it's easy to write off these perspectives as anti-science 
But I think that we're all a little tired of intense polarization and dehumanization of other people on other sides and suggest taking a closer look here. And some people say that, well, they just need to be better educated about the science and the case, and that'll win them over. In social science research, especially, especially around um, public understanding of science and technology in general, time and again disproves this assumption. In fact, increased education, um, and I'm not talking about increases of misinformation, but increased education about a particular topic like genetic engineering tends to intensify positions rather than shift them. So all of these things come together and have us thinking about the complexity of chestnut restoration that may use a, transgen a transgenic tree. And to add an extra layer of complexity here, um, it would be wise to also consider that these organisms that will ideally, if, if restored, spread back into unmanaged environments. The question of tribal sovereignty is critical here in the United States. So in addition to self-determination, how might these applications of genetic manipulation influence indigenous people's legal sovereignty and their relationship with their non-human relatives? Uh, again, we're talking about shared environments um, and complex social landscapes. And this is an older headline um, and often just used to sort of spark conversation, but it is a true headline from a few years ago from one of the um, one of the biotech tree conferences. But indigenous peoples and in generally came together early on in the development of these GE tree conversations, calling them another form of colonization. Now, We'll get to the complexity and the texture behind what that might mean, and this is not a blanket position, but these are just sort of the some of the dimensions at play when we're talking to make, about making these big decisions, um, drawing on some of the values that, that Evelyn um, discussed in her talk, but really thinking through what are some of the features and dimensions of these cases. And so circling back around to how I think about it, I, I fundamentally grapple with this question, how do we make decisions about genetic, genetic engineering for species protection? Um, and more specifically, on, on what do we base the decision? Um, who gets to make these decisions? We, we want to say that it's an evidence-based or it's a science issue, but there are incredible layers of values that underpin even the science that's being done. And then the question that I've spent considerable time on and we'll touch on a little bit today is how does the potential use of a GE chestnut for species restoration intersect with indigenous belief systems and tribal sovereignty? Even though some argue these species restoration or protection projects represent an example of good genetic engineering, the fundamental question remains, are these projects ecological restoration or a greater threat to wild systems? And, and who gets to decide? Um, we don't all share the, the answer to those questions and whose answer ends up mattering more. And to figure this out, <laughs> I turn to the tools of social science. Um, of course, there's plenty of biology involved in these issues, but the decisions, the perceptions, the relationships, the power dynamics, all of these happen in human systems. So see, so these are some of the big questions that I think about to point to some of these other issues I consider. So what are the human dimensions of these problems and their proposed solutions? What are the social, cultural, and political issues that surround these proposed projects? How do different groups perceive the problems and proposed solutions? And fundamentally, how are decisions made? One of the key mechanisms for bringing people together to think about these hard problems is through community, stakeholder, and public engagement. And that's one of the most central parts of the work that I do, and it's certainly my favorite part. But engagement is a challenging word. In a lot of circles, it gets conflated with science outreach or communication, both of which are important parts of engagement, but insufficient, necessary, but not sufficient. 
I use engagement drawing on this NASIM report from 2016. I use it to mean seeking and facilitating the sharing and exchange of knowledge, perspectives, and preferences between or among groups who often have differences in expertise, power, and values. And um, there are other dimensions of engagement to consider just to sort of get you more um, accustomed to hearing these ideas and how we can make decisions this way. Uh, engagement at its best is ongoing and iterative. It's not one workshop. It's ongoing communication, deliberation, relationship building, reflection by all of the parties involved, and ultimately it empowers all sides to influence one another and shape collective decisions. So we keep coming back to this idea of shared environments and collective decisions that we make about shared environments. But we can't ignore that we don't all hold the same power in making those decisions. And so how can we um, construct engagement that opens that up? Just one more idea, or I guess vision of engagement, thinking about how this mutual trust, I'm sorry, mutual learning, this trust building and, and this substantive input can sort of feed into this idea of democratic deliberation that's characterized by transparency and justice. And so how all of this um, could fit into this chestnut question, that's, that's what's coming up. So briefly, what can this look like? A few years ago, the research team that I work with um, organized and facilitated this stakeholder workshop just to start thinking about ways to engage different groups to deliberate about these questions, to ask how might broader publics be, in, be involved. Some of the issues and details have since sort of been updated, but this, is a, this report is an illustration of what some of these processes look like in action. And it's a really useful tool for those of you interested in some of these ideas and some of these complexities to check out, and the link is there. And in preparation for that workshop, we also wanted to think about how to center communities and groups that have long been excluded from environmental decision making. We wanted to be mindful of colonial histories in the US, but also of colonial histories and conservation in general. Um, that's, that's another talk for another day, but it's a very important one. And given the proximity of so many sovereign tribal lands to the labs and field trial sites in, in and around Syracuse, New York, um, circled there in red, and the contemporary boundaries of tribal lands are in purple. Um, so again, and, and given that proximity, we, we set out to engage with members of the Haudenosaunee Environmental Task Force, so some leadership from these communities, and explore one, how they'd been engaged around this question of chestnut restoration with a GE tree and think about their perspectives. Um, a number of publications have come out of this work over the years and I'm happy to share them with you if they're not already linked to, to the talk. Um, but a few key points to take away from some of this work. The idea of restoring the chestnut, um, going back to some of Evelyn's points about moral imperatives or you know, what is our, what is our role as stewards, but the idea of restoring the chestnut isn't as exciting to many of the citizens of these nations that we talked to. For one, the time of chestnut loss coincided with the time of Indian schools, so Indigenous children were removed forcibly from homes, forbidden from using their language and learning many of their customs. So that cultural line, that cultural relationship to chestnut trees is pretty fundamentally ruptured and has been for um, a couple of generations now. There's some evidence that restoration and in, in the way that we've talked about it may offer space to repair that relationship, but it's, it's complicated. <laughs> um, so for a lot of the community, to a lot of the community members that we spoke with, genetic engineering does run counter to their worldview. Um, but rather than necessarily wanting to stop you from doing it or even planting trees on uh, your lands, even though that does worry them, um, I think I think I would safely argue that their biggest concern was maintaining sovereignty. 
And there are a number of legal dimensions of sovereignty spelled out by treaties and other agreements in the United States government, um, with the United States government. From the Haudenosaunee perspective here, as decisions about chestnut restoration are made, they want these things to be considered amongst mothers. Um, one, given specific consideration for traditional Haudenosaunee governance institutions, so they have maintained their traditional governance structures and making sure that if we're talking about the U.S. government making decisions about the GE chestnut, that the government to government relationship is respected and maintained. And again, through that, an understanding of an, an understanding of the longstanding treaty agreements and their implications. But fundamentally, it's important that we, um, as work doing allied work, especially appreciate that there's a deep history of mistrust that underpins tribal consultation process. So really thinking about our own role and making sure that we're not reproducing some of these colonial imbalances as we think about what uh, positions we take and how we have our positions put forward. Another part of sovereignty is a little more subtle. Um, we need to grapple with difficult histories of indigenous life in the United States, as well as the epistemic dominance of Western scientific perspectives, um, which have largely prevented indigenous peoples from living in accordance with their worldviews. I was really happy to hear Evelyn bring up um, just the word epistemic in your presentation. It really set me up nicely. Um, uh, because it's such a fundamental part of how we approach our, our meaning a European American versions of environmental decision making come from our cultural perspectives. But ignoring these dis worldview distinctions risks reproducing environmental injustices that are again rooted in the dominance of other ways of relating to and knowing and making decisions about the natural environment. So we need to grapple with these things. And when it comes to chestnut restoration, this is one important consideration when we think about diversity and inclusion in the context of environmental decision making. How could we make decisions that avoid reproducing some of these historical problems? And I use we fast and loose. No, I admit that. Um, yet another illustration about sovereignty is here. There's not a single, there's not like one single indigenous perspective. I've been working with the Haudenosaunee in central and upstate New York for gosh, a number of years now. Um, we're, but we need to remember that there's hundreds of tribal groups in the US and while sovereignty might mean self-determination to all of them, what they do with that self-determination is as unique as you can imagine. So while Haudenosaunee communities may want to keep GE chestnut, chestnuts off their land for their reasons, hop down the Appalachian Ridge and you may find that the, the members of the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians want chestnut orchards. And I, I know that Jared's done some work with them and that's a really interesting and cool project um, in development too. The prevailing question though, and the one that, I, that keeps me up at night sometimes is how do we create decision-making systems that fit all of this together? And I've only touched on like one sliver of diversity and inclusion in the context of landscape-wide decision-making. It's an important one. There's legal prep, there's legal basis for thinking about this set of communities, but there is a wide range of diversity of values and worldviews to consider. And again, we return to the question of how do we make shared decisions, make decisions about shared environments. One of the take home points I like to end with is recommending approaching these questions from the perspective of epistemic humility. Um, and that means coming in knowing that your expertise and worldview are cultural and learned, and not everyone shares your assumptions. So what are the implications of that? And that's what makes democracy so complex. How do we create decision-making spaces that balances these perspectives when exclusion of so many perspectives is a direct result of some pretty nasty histories of colonialism and white supremacy? So how do we reconsider the language that we use, including, our, including language like American purity? When we think we're talking about trees, this language would still matter. And I think it's really important that we situate ourselves in context, historical context, um, so that we are aware of how 
our motivations are filtered and perceived in, by others. So there's nearly 8 billion of us now, maybe we passed that, I don't know, on, on the planet and almost as many ways to think about how we relate to the universe. So how do we wrangle all of these values and cultural differences into decisions that help us live in better relationship with the planet and all of its inhabitants? I'm not gonna answer that fully today, but I think one of the coolest things about the chestnut case is that there's still so much time to continue developing good relationships with our neighbors and develop strategies for restoration that are based on justice and inclusion. One of the questions earlier asked a really powerful and important question, like if you're talking about a bunch of private landowners, how do you even grapple with those ethics? Um, my research group argues that it's like there's there's systems of engagement that really could be brought to this conversation um, to, to start to think through those uh, decision making systems together. But I think too there's incredible opportunity here with um, TACF or the foundation in general, um, both the leadership and the membership to set precedent for approaching these issues from a place of collaboration and shared stewardship rather than divisiveness. And I'm confident that engagement and the kind of work that our research team does could play a critical role in bringing all of this together. And that's me. Excellent, thank you, Katie. We covered a lot of ground today <laughs> um, and a lot of disparate ground, but I hope people can start to see where all of these fairly seemingly, you know, very widely dispersed questions and um, topics intersect. And, and that's, you know, how we take on this question of restoration. Um, I'm going to ask some of the questions first that folks, and, um, acknowledging that we're nine minutes here until one, and, and we're going to have a hard stop at one o'clock. So I'm going to cover as many of those of these as we can. Rob, I think this question is for you, if you're still with us. Uh, John asks, uh, John Hempel asks a tangential question regarding the refugia you shared. Has anyone ever looked at what was in the Yucatan 10,000 years ago? And, and were chestnuts down there? Yeah, I, I, I don't know if they were there. I'm sure people have tried to reconstruct some of the, the flora from the Yucatan around that time period. Um, I, I think that probably it was more sort of grassland uh, at that time, but I don't know if any, but I just don't, I'm not familiar with the literature on, on the Yucatan, so I don't know, but it's a great question. I mean, I think probably many of our North American species were, were pushed into Mexico during that time. Um, you know, there are some species today that, that do range from, you know, Southern Canada all the way down into parts of Mexico. You can find some of them or even closely related species. So I, I would be surprised if there weren't some Castania down there. I just don't know for sure. Yeah, I'm not either. I'll have to look into that. Um, Evelyn, I think this question is for you uh, from Margaret. She asks, if humans have introduced a disease into plants, why is that different than doing the same thing in humans like COVID, for instance? In the medical profession, we think we have to treat diseases in humans. How could it be a different ethic to do the same thing for plants? I thought that might be a better question for you, Sarah. Oh. <laughs> um, I, I mean, I, what I could say about that question is that I think that what medicine and uh, conservation practice share is that it's science, but it's also normative, right? And so it's like, well, we're, we're guided by what we can do, but when we decide what to do, those are, those are always going to be moral choices. Um, whether you, even if you do nothing, it's still a moral choice because you're just, you have, if you have enough knowledge to do something and you decide to do nothing, then there's a reason for that. And, you know, I don't think there, there are plant diseases that maybe we shouldn't treat, right? There, that's, we can't manage the whole world, but, um, but in something like this, we're worried about, we're worried about the extinction of a species. So yeah, I, Sarah, you, I thought you might have an answer to that. I, I think that's a great question. I, you know, and, and we kind of wrestle with this with the foundation in terms of, um, how do people choose to where their donation dollars dollars go right i mean uh, why would someone give to the american chestnut foundation give 40 bucks to join that rather than giving 40 dollars to kids with cancer you know i mean there that is <laughs> Uh, that sounds sort of sort of glib, but I mean it's no. I struggle with that. That's not. I struggle with that, right? Yeah. There's a yeah. 
So it's, it's a tough question, but I think, you know, you, you, you balance that internally, you balance with what is it that you value. And, um, you know, I think it doesn't mean that you don't care about that other thing. It's just, you say, well, other people are working that. So th there's a big string. If you guys go through the answer questions, there's a big string with another fellow who wants to know why we're not doing enough with um, the remnant population of American chestnuts, trying to build up resistance in the native populations. And we're doing that, but it doesn't get a lot of play. It doesn't get a lot of play as much as GMOs, but because that's sort of the, the new technology and it's given us the most resistance as back crossbreeding, because that gives us even more resistance than, than working with, with uh, native um, wild type populations. So this perception that we don't care about it or we're not working on it is primarily um, one, because it's, it's not as big of a part of what we do, but we do it. Um, we don't do cancer research, but I think um, there's this, this, you know, sort of balance of where can you set those priorities and how can you balance? Well, folks are working on that. They're doing what they can. We're working on this problem. It's, it's a different type of problem and it, it, it certainly is an issue as well, but everybody's got to pick where they're going to throw their resources. It, it also feels like in some ways there's kind of a, there's a time dimension to this too, where we, we witnessed the functional extirpation of the species in a generation or less. And now it, it feels like, should there be a, an impetus to try to, you know, conserve and restore it within another generation. But that raises these issues that I think really intersect with what Katie was talking about, that human, that human component, the cultural component about taking that longer view on how people conceive of changes to the environment too, or, or human mediated changes. So I, I really appreciated some of what you were talking about, Katie, and sort of how people value these or place value on different changes to the environment or species in the environment. So um, we got three minutes to go. I'm gonna tackle one more. And then those of you who, who ask questions, we, we will do our best to get to you back through email or some other format. We'll do our best to, to get uh, back to that question. And I have a feeling we're gonna revisit this type of format in, in a few months too, because there's just, there's so much rich um, uh, discussion to be had here. But uh, Anthony asks, um, Anthony Sutton, biology crosses borders in general. What in particular, what is it particular about either the chestnut tree or the Native American borders that makes this issue different than the cross-border effects that any polity has on its neighbors when it affects its environment? That's a really good question. Um, and there's two parts to it. Um, one being, if you're talking about self-determination and sovereignty and the tribal governments perspective or policies on their own is that genetic engineering is functionally different from other um, forms of breeding, then the legal frameworks suggest that it should be a government to government meeting. And a lot of times these communities are just treated like another stakeholder, throw them into the public register. And that's fundamentally not how it's really supposed to be going according to these treaties that, I mean, we're not great at keeping treaty promises, but if we want to be like optimistic and idealistic about it, these are our fundamentally government to government relationships. So, I mean, I think that the question about polity means like, are, would you, why is it different than perhaps if species crossed over into Canada. And we do have international agreements um, that are more tightly held to, to the letter of the law with some place like Canada than we do with some place like the Onondaga Nation. Um, and the other thing that's really important to remember is history matters here. Like it doesn't dictate everything that happens now, but we're talking about like four or 500 years of genocide. And you wanna think like, well, if you have the ability to be a good faith neighbor and bring the government to government relationship to bear, it's a really simple way for groups like, you know, TCF has good, I believe in your good faith. Like, I think that's a, this is a great example of how an organization can work with the federal government to make just a little like step in the right direction of bringing these sort of justices forward. Um, so it, it like, there's a lot of history to, to undo, but if we can make one step, why not? Cause it's kind of low hanging fruit for this case. Um, and I think that there's a lot of normative commitment to my answer and I'm fully aware of that and okay with it. <laughs> well, I think you bring up a really um, good point and, and actually all three of you did is is let's look at it at a time scale. You know, we've we've lost chestnut for a hundred years, but we've have um, chestnut restoration is minimum 200, 300 more years of uh, restoring a species is gonna take a lot of time. You know, exactly how long is gonna depend on a lot of different factors, but we have to have a really long view. And I think 
you know, um, not thinking, well, um, back cross chestnut is it, or darling 58 is it like, you know, being able to say, okay, this is the start of something that's very long-term and we need to have these conversations and realize that whatever decisions we make now, we're going to implement adaptive management you know, both ecologically and politically and socially, because there's going to be lots of different factors that are going to affect it over the centuries long um, time span that it's going to take to address this issue. Um, we're out of time. Yeah, Evelyn. I was just going to add that there's so much value added too that it's not just about chestnut, right? But it's about you, you know, people want to restore chestnut and at the same time they learn about forest health in general and they learn about about environmental values in general and so there's more at stake even. Using it as a poster child. Yeah. Um, excellent. Well, um, thank you, everybody. Um, I really appreciate your time. I highly recommend, we will post what's in the chat. There's so much rich conversation going on in the chat, some really good comments, uh, still some great co conversation going on in the Q&A. All of that will be posted on the uh, Chestnut Chat um, website, so acf.org, I think, slash Chestnut Chat. Google Chestnut Chat. It'll come up. <laughs> um, it's the first thing. Um, so if you want to revisit this, uh, do that. Uh, Katie, Rob, Evelyn, thank you so much. This was really fun. I really enjoyed, you know, kind of weaving all of these topics together and sort of it, there's a lot of food for thought. And I think we're going to get a lot of questions generated from that. Um, I'm going to say my goodbyes. Um, do you guys have anything? If you guys have anything else and, and Lisa, I'll leave it to you guys for any last words. Just want to say thank you for having me. And I hope to see you all in October <laughs> in person. Yes. yes, October 30th, Asheville. <laughs> That would be just yeah. great. Thank you, Robert, Evelyn, and Katie. You guys were wonderful. What an amazing topic. I loved it. And just a little bit of good news um, since um, the indigenous communities came up several times today, hopefully mid um, April, we've got it approved by their attorneys, but we are signing a memorandum of understanding with the Eastern Band of the Cherokee Indians. Um, it's our first tribal MOU. We're really excited about it. it it's a long story how it came about. Be looking at your Chestnut Magazine. We're going to be writing it up, but it's I'm really excited about it. I've also spoken with the Miami tribe in Oklahoma. Um, so it's it's starting to um, take ha get some legs. So I'm really excited about that. Um, not every tribe is anti-GMO. They're very open to it. And Cherokees are anyway. So that's good news. And I want to wish you guys a ha happy weekend. Thank you for hanging in there. I think we could have talked about this all afternoon, don't you, Sarah? <laughs> Absolutely. And I lied. I'm going to say more. I, I, I didn't actually say my last words. Next month, next April, we're going to talk about the fungus again. So we, we opened up this year's, uh, our January chestnut chat was about the chestnut blight fungus. We're going to talk more about what's in those cankers, the complexity of cankers. What are all the organisms that live in that thing? Um, what is cruddy bark? How, how do we understand more about chestnut blight, its pathogenicity, how it affects the American chestnut? Very different topic, <laughs> um, but we like to bounce around on this. So I'll stop now. Thank you guys. <laughs>